first letter to the Corinthians. It be the God and Father of our Lord. Chapter 1 and verse 3. Fight the good fight. Timothy chapter 6. subject is to timing the Lord which is traced throughout this chapter and I propose to proceed as in our previous study in the manner of a Bible reading and go through as many of the verses as we can because the argument is so important and so applicable to the churches today and to us as individual believers today also. And here is the first extraordinary uh, appeal that the inspired prophet has. They say, if a man put away his wife, this comes from the law, the law of Moses, this comes from Deuteronomy, the fact that uh, if uh, a man, in this case is expressed as a man toward a woman, but if a man finds his wife to be unfaithful to him, and there is a valid and legitimate divorce, because she's be betrayed him and been unfaithful. And then presumably, the text doesn't say this, but presumably that second husband has in due course put her away also, or he's died and she's a widow, or something has happened, he's deserted her. Uh, should the original husband return to her? Under the law of Moses, no. In fact, that was uh, uh, a terrible thing to do and would bring disgrace, Moses says, upon the whole land. And this example is brought in here to show the extraordinary mercy and kindness of God. Because Israel, and it's the northern kingdom of Israel, which is in mind in this first verse, we pick up the thread in verse 8, and it's clear this is the northern kingdom, which of course has already long since gone into captivity. Samaria has fallen and so on. But uh, looking back at uh, Israel, she had not been unfaithful to God once, but numerous times. And yet God, in his readiness to be merciful, would still have her back. And even though the nation, the northern kingdom that is, the ten tribes have been dis well disbanded and taken into captivity their history has been brought to a full end that's the end of them yet after so long a time God will still receive them back so this illustration of uh, the uh, uh, man who might just marry his former wife against the law of Moses uh, this is brought in here to show the extraordinary and almost unreasonable mercy and kindness of God. Thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again unto me, saith the Lord. God will receive her. His mercy is so great. And this, of course, comes up repeatedly in the Old Testament. The long periods of time through which God bore with disobedient people, and people who behaved appallingly. The number of warnings, the centuries of lesser chastisements before he moved and brought them into a captive condition. And so it is, it speaks to us today, the mercy of God, the kindness of God is amazing. And let me just apply it to us very simply. Should we, uh, and this the mercy of God should never be an encouragement or an excuse to us to allow ourselves to wander from the path. But if we have wandered from the path and we have uh, whittled down to almost nothing our devotional times and our reading of God's word and then ultimately the enemy has taken advantage of that and we've been swept into spiritual coldness and we're almost nominal Christians praying very little Something terrible has happened and then we begin to feel so bad about it. We think, well, God will not have me back now. I've gone much too far. I'm so far away and we cannot bring ourselves to return and to repent. Passages like this are of enormous help to God's people. If he would have been so merciful 
even to those unregenerate people, even to the northern kingdom of Israel, long after her last opportunity had been turned down and he would have forgiven them, how much more will he be gracious and merciful to his people? And whatever poor, shabby state we may get into to our neglect or our foolishness, return to him as soon as you can. Go back on your knees and restore your personal devotions. Don't let the devil whisper in your ear, it's too late, it cannot be done, it will never be the same. He may try everything to take advantage of your waywardness. But here we just get another insight into the astonishing loving kindness of the Lord and his mercy. And if he would plead with them, return unto me. How much more will he receive back his blood-bought people from their wanderings? Never let that be an excuse for living lightly the Christian life, but there's always kindness and mercy with the Lord for wandering people. Well, let's go through to verse 2. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been lying with. There's hardly a Canaanite god that you haven't worshipped, is the message. There's hardly a Canaanite shrine you have not imitated. There's hardly a hilltop around the Holy Land which hasn't been turned into a shrine by the Jews and the Northern Kingdom is in mind, particularly at some time. And then the second half of verse 2, in the ways hast thou sat for them as the Arabian, the Arab, in the wilderness. And the illustration implicit there is no doubt those uh, among the Arabs who nomadic people who would live by plundering and would attack caravans. And they were notorious for it. And they would pick up intelligence. They'd know when the treasure laden, the wealthy caravans were coming through a particular desert area, waste area, and they would uh, organize themselves and ambush. They'd study this, this when the caravan came, how they would pounce with what uh, viciousness, aggression, and delight. And uh, the illustration of marauding Arabs is no doubt here, and the idea is that the people of God have pursued idolatry with the same care and intelligence and planning and then delight. Have they gone and worshipped those idols? They believed in them, you see. This wasn't just a nominal thing or a long shot thing, we'll try the gods of the Canaanites. They believed in these things. They put their trust in them. They did two things at once. Strictly, they didn't syncretize religions. They were uh, God-worshipping Israelites sometimes and idolaters at other times. They ran two quite different and opposed religious systems at the same time. That was what they did. And that was an awful thing and an abomination. And so this... Uh, very dramatic language is used. At the end of verse 2, Thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. And how brazen they'd been. Verse 3, Therefore the showers have been withholden. Well, God had warned about that in the time of Moses, that his principal punishment for idolatry would be to bring about drought. And that happened repeatedly. So it happened to Israel, of course. And there has been no latter rain. And thou hadst a whore's forehead. In other words, the regular prostitute has no conscience and is brazen about it. And if she were to be accused by the village elders, she'd tough it out. She's quite brazen. She isn't going to burst into tears. She's as tough as they come. And that's why she's pressed into service by way of illustration. Thou hadst a whore's forehead. Thou refused to be ashamed. Incapable of shame, this has gone on so long. That's the picture there. And, of course, there is a warning for us too. Always listen to the discipline of the Lord. 
If we should wander to and fro, neglect some vital duty, if we should commit some compromise with the world or some sin, and there is a discipline upon us, first of all, the disciplines of God are gentle. It will begin with the troubling of the conscience. Listen to it. Be sensitive. Pray daily for a tender conscience. Always respond and seek the Lord's help and get away from that thing that we've got into. And if we don't, and conscience then fails to work, and we become brazen, and we make our compromise a regular thing, that particular lascivious program on the television, the rubbish, the nonsense, and we even allow ourselves as God's people to be hooked or something like that, and then the punishment becomes more severe and something more burdensome to you. Listen to it. Respond to it. Don't ever be in the position with worldliness or any sin or anything else which those people got into with their idolatry, where they became so brazen they were not touched anymore. What a tragedy to allow that to happen. So in verse 4, Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, says God, My Father, thou art the guide of my youth. Cry to him. Will he reserve his anger forever? Verse 5, Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. And the sense seems to be, you have gone through religious exercises. And you may have spoken words of repentance. And you may have confessed the Lord in your worship of the true God. But at the same time, you've kept your sinful behaviour. Thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. So the prayer, the repentance, the worship was not legitimate, not valid, not heard. It was an offence to God. It was an accom accompanied by wrongdoing. Well, verse 6 brings us to a new section. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? And the theme is the same. She's gone up every high mountain under every green tree and worshipped Canaanite gods, fertility gods, or they were the most popular Canaanite gods, all of them. And verse 7, And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Treacherous. The Hebrew indicates deceitful. Something along those lines. Well, Israel was deceitful. She was doing two things at once. Pretending she worshipped the true God and yet worshipping idols. And we'll say a little more about that in due course. But Judah, the southern kingdom, that of course was preserved for very much longer, she did not fear. She did not say to herself, well, uh, judgment will come upon Israel. And when it came and Samaria fell in 722 BC and the Assyrians took the people captive and restocked the land with others, moved from elsewhere, Judah didn't say, we better give up our idolatry because this could happen to us. Who would have thought that the ten northern tribes would finally come under the judgment that the prophets have warned of? And they should have been stirred. But they were not, and this is the argument here, that it had affected Judah also. Judah, end of verse 8, feared not, but went and played the harlot also. And back to Israel in verse 9, it came to pass through the likeness of her whoredom. She did it without conscience. She worshipped idols easily. She made light of the whole thing. She didn't think, consider, this was a serious sin. Because of the lightness of her whoredom, she defiled the land and she committed adultery, spiritual adultery, of course, with stones, stone figures, images, and with stocks, wooden images and figures. 
She used everything that came to hand. And uh, we think of today in the churches. We have idolatry today, even in the churches of Jesus Christ. We mention it often. We warn of it often. Maybe it's in individual lives, even in our midst. Who knows? The idolatry of the world. All that music, I mention it again, designed by worldlings to promote sin and rebellion and sexual liberty and so on, pressed into service in the churches, the intoxicating, crashing rhythms, the uh, uh, hypnotic rhythms, and everything that was designed by the world to be part of this world's evil system. And it's trusted. It's trusted by churches. We can't win souls without this, without adapting, without helping ourselves to the sinful aspects of worldly culture. And they trust that more than they trust in God. And so individuals say, oh, but I need this. must be thumping in my ears to give me a lift, to give me a better mood, to hold me and sustain me. And I cling on to these things that were my worldly, distinctively sinful and worldly pleasures that held me to the world and caused me, taught me to serve those things which the, the world does and practices. Well, friends, it's, a, it's modern idolatry. And just as the Israelites and then the people of Judah went to the idols of the Canaanites, so the Christian church today, or huge parts of it, is just given over to what 30 or 40 years ago would have been regarded as unthinkable. It is amazing how things have changed. Why there was a time, most of you are too young, but not all of you, to know it, when it was universally accepted among the churches of Christ, all of them, without exception, that there was a great gulf between the world and the church, and you didn't adopt the sinful aspects of their entertainment culture, or the things that were specifically created, designed and created to serve those ends. But that's been changed. Famous preachers do it, less famous preachers, churches everywhere, and they've never justified it. Isn't that amazing? They never said, well, for 1960-odd years, because that's when it all started to turn, for all that time, all the churches of Christ and all the teachers and the preachers were absolutely sure that the Bible said no. Now we say that all of church history was wrong. But they've never argued it from the scriptures. They've just done it. They've never justified it. They've just done it. What is becoming seen everywhere now has never been scripturally argued, justified, presented at all. It's astonishing. And that's evidence enough that people have chased after idols without conscience and without consideration. It's one of the tragedies of our time. But what about individual Christians? When you came to Christ, did you throw away, whenever it was, however long ago, your records, then your tapes, then your discs, and so on. Did they all go? Did you get rid of them? Well, you should have done. You should have put the world out completely. You should have switched your recreational delights to things that were not composed and written and created to serve the devil's agenda. There should be a great gap between us and the world, but I must come back to the passage in hand. Will I come down to verse 11? And the Lord said unto me, says Jeremiah, the backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Why ever would the Lord say that? Having condemned Israel for this, she's now said, in a manner of speaking, to be more justified than Judah. Well, she fell first, whereas Judah had the example of Israel's fall. She did these things, she came under judgment and, to, and she fell, and then Judah did it too. Well, she'd always done it, but she increased the intensity with which she sinned. And so uh, the Lord says, it is as though Israel is more just than Judah, because she didn't 
she wasn't going, falling, uh, notwithstanding a clear example of what would happen to her. She had no justification, of course, but there's that difference. Look at verse 12. Now, Jeremiah is given an instruction. Go and proclaim these words toward the north. To Israel, even though she fell long, long ago. I I'm not sure of the status of these words, but taking them as they come, I imagine Jeremiah did make preaching visits to the north where there were some Israelites who'd moved back into their country and been permitted to do so, to preach to them during the time of Josiah. And if not he himself personally, then perhaps he'd sent others from the school of the prophets to go to the north and to preach. But evidently, verse 12, there was to be a proclamation to backsliding Israel and their people, wherever they were dispersed, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. There was still an opportunity, even after what had seemed to be the final sentence, for them to receive mercy, but they never took it. Verse 13, only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Now, there begins in verse 14 an extraordinary prophecy. Verse 13 emphasizes repentance. Time is going on, so I don't want to pause there too long, but repentance is so vital. Of course, faith in Christ is the way to salvation, but coupled with faith is repentance, the doctrine of repentance unto life. There must be faith in the atoning merits of Christ and his death on Calvary, and there must be sincere repentance. Oh, there have been so many efforts to get rid of repentance. It's emphasized so much even in the Old Testament. I had occasion the other day to refresh my memory on evangel evangelism explosion, uh, which started in America in the late 70s. And it's a very, very big uh, international organization now. And uh, I heard of a particular church, supposedly a reformed church, that had adopted for the instruction of all its workers, visitors and so on, EE, Evangelism Explosion, as the script from which they would work. And I thought, really? A reformed church doing that? From what I remember of EE, it was an appalling script. So I went online to see if there'd been some astonishing reform or improvement. But no, it was exactly the same as it always was. Now, fair enough, in the script, there's a few words you're supposed to say to the needy person, the person, the unconverted person. It, it does definitely say, which is an improvement on the original, uh, about sin and about the need for the atoning death of Christ as, and grace as the only way whereby one can be saved. It's all a bit hurried and quick. It's just about there. It's there as the doctrine of the fall and the need for repentance and so on. But when it comes, that really it's based on the same old formula, you know, where you're going, where you die, when you die, do you want to go to heaven, words along those lines, that kind of thing. Well, that's never a bad start. But anyway, uh, it really focuses on that. It quickly mentions what is evidently a bit embarrassing, the problem of sin and the atoning death of Christ. And then it says, now this is all you have to do. Just trust Christ. Just believe in him. Just acknowledge him to be Lord. And then there's the quick prayer in which repentance is covered in about three and a half words. And there's no time to reflect, no time to think. You've got to clinch this deal before the person loses interest and get them saved. So there's a, a quick prayer and then immediately you assure the person that they're saved. They're now Christian and so on. Well, that's absolutely hopeless. 
That's just about mentioned repentance somewhere, but it's actually skated over the bringing of a person to repentance, the implementation of repentance, what it is, explaining it, and so on. It's far, far more here in Jeremiah chapter 3. But E.E. E. ignores it all. And, uh, 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 well, uh, we call it easy believism. There's no real repentance. There can be no conversion. The Arminians, or some of them, uh, see the fault too, and they call it quick prayerism. And so it is. And uh, people are assured that they're Christian and they really know nothing about repentance. But that isn't the case here. Verse 13. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God who you've offended and how you've offended him and hast scattered thy ways and what you've done in detail in the idolatry on the hilltops and the shrines, and have not obeyed my voice, said the Lord. That's a pretty comprehensive summary of repentance. It's got to be sincerely done. But then in verse 14 begins the prophecy. And it's a tremendous prophetic passage. Turn, O backsliding children, said the Lord, for I am married unto you, and here it begins, I will take you, one of a city, not many, this is a very small remnant, uh, the figures won't be literal, this will be uh, a general speech which indicates that God will have mercy on a small number, one of a city, and two of a family, that actually means a clan, not, not a, a tribe, more than that but a subdivision, a subfamily within a tribe. One of a city, two of a clan, and I will bring you to Zion. Now this is a promise that at some future time, when there is true repentance, a remnant shall be saved. A number shall be saved. Not the whole number of Israel, but some of them. And then look, verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now when might this prophecy have been fulfilled? We're going to read more of it in just a moment. At what stage? Well, uh, it would have been in a small way fulfilled even with the return of Judah, as far as Judah was concerned, from Babylon with the small remnant that returned from Babylonian captivity to Jerusalem and to Judah. And we don't know, but there may have been a, a number of people from the kingdom of Israel, the former kingdom of Israel, who found their way down there too, though there's no solid information about that. So that would, but it wouldn't be a real fulfillment because... We know nothing about Israel, and this prophecy is primarily addressed to Israel. That was a return from captivity of a remnant of the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, certainly there were some good pastors given to them. We've just been studying the book of Nehemiah, and we know that. Well, they had Ezra for a start. They had Nehemiah, he wasn't exactly a pastor. He was a politician. But he was far better as a pastor than many of the regular pastors. What he did for them and how he restored after Ezra, worship and so on. And then they had quite a few good Levites. We know that from the part played by the Levites in the restored worship while Nehemiah was in Jerusalem. So there was a small degree of fulfillment even with the return uh, to, from Babylon to Judah and Jerusalem but nothing like the fulfillment of the promise, the prophecy, as it's given here. I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. This would be a fulfilled prophecy later than the return from Babylon. And verse 16, it shall come to pass 
when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, at the time this prophecy is fulfilled, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. Well, the ark of the covenant uh, with the mercy seat, what happened to that? Well, we don't know. But when uh, Nebuchadnezzar finally destroyed the temple and Jerusalem, he either took it back to Babylon with the uh, treasures from the house of the Lord and it got lost there somewhere and disappeared entirely from view or he took the gold off it or his people and the, uh, uh, the coverings and it was destroyed and lost perhaps in the destruction of Jerusalem. Anyway, we know it was there at the time of jo King Josiah because it's mentioned earlier on. And uh, uh, we know after that, they never had it. It disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to it. So there's a minor fulfillment. When they rebuilt the temple under Ezra, and then, of course, the wall, the city wall, under Nehemiah, there was no ark there, and they were worshipping without it. But this isn't the fulfillment. This looks to a time when nobody's even interested in the ark of the Lord, because... Christ has come, and the symbols are now in the past. The new Zion, the Jewish Gentile International Christian Church, which begins through the coming of Christ, and formerly on the day of Pentecost. Now we have Christ. We don't need the foreshadowings, the ark and the mercy seat, and all those things, nor any of the articles of worship in the old tabernacle and temples. So the complete fulfillment of this passage is the coming of Christ. And I remind you of it. If for people who return to God, verse 14, then they will be brought to Zion. The Zion that will be brought to pass at the time of Christ. The new church. Verse 15 They'll be given pastors according to mine heart. Some people say this is all a future millennium. But in a future millennium, we will not need pastors according to God's own heart. But this is what happens with the coming of Christ. And they'll feed you with knowledge and understanding. And you'll be multiplied and increased in the land. And nobody will worry about the symbols, the end of verse 16, because we have the reality. We have Christ. Verse 17. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. What in the period of the Christian church? Well certainly at the beginning of it. Because everything happens in Jerusalem. Calvary was just outside Jerusalem. The atoning death of Christ. We associate with Jerusalem the beginning of the Christian church. The fulfillment of all the prophecies. And the work of Christ. At that time, well, Jerusalem will be big in our minds and imagination. And all the nations shall be gathered unto it. At least they will all be gathered unto and at Jerusalem. Calvary, the age of the Gentiles will begin. People will be converted from all lands. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. Look at verse 18. Something else will happen. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. Israel and Judah will be together again. In what sense? Well, because just as Gentiles will be converted, so Jews will be converted. Many of them, well, two of a clan, one of a city, as it were, uh, a remnant, yes, just as with Gentiles. But Jews will be converted, and among them will be those who have their line all the way back to the northern tribes and Israel, and those whose line goes back to Judah. It will happen because all kinds of Jews will have their membership in the Church of Jesus Christ 
which is what we have now. And then at the end of verse 18, they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given them for an inheritance unto your fathers. Was that fulfilled with the coming of the Messiah and the beginning of the church age? Well, in a sense, it is fulfilled. What is one of the great components of the gospel? One of the things that we preach about, one of the blessings that is a, accompanies conversion, the things that buoy, buoy us up and such a blessing to us, the heavenly hope, of course, the promise of the land, it was literally fulfilled when they entered into Canaan, but that those land promises were just a type of the eternal land when this beautified, rejuvenated, probably greatly enlarged earth will be amalgamated, as it were, with heaven, a heavenly yet physical earth, and it'll be for the everlasting possession of the people of God. Canaan was only a poor symbol and type and prophecy of what was to come. We as good as have it now, because Christ has died to bring it about to bring about a ransom people who will occupy it eternally. And we have the hope of heaven. We have the land promise with us in the Christian age in that sense. And then verse 19. But I said, and God is speaking, how shall I put thee, Israel, that no longer exists, people in captivity, Soon Judah will follow them into captivity. How shall I put thee among the children in the new Zion and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the hosts of nations, along with Judah, converted people from Judah, along with Gentile converts? And I said, God is speaking, this is how it will be done. Thou shalt call me my father, and shalt not turn away from me. In other words, it'll be done through profession of the Lord, the giving up of all idolatry and repentance, as well as faith. Well, we have a little more to do. There's the appeal of verse 22. Return, ye backsliding children. But look what happens in verse 21. I've missed it. I've passed over it. Look at this, it's very important. A voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel. What's this? The children of Israel are repenting, and they're weeping, and they're acknowledging that they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. After all, is there authentic repentance from Israel? No, says Jeremiah. Look at the verse again. Look at the clue. Look at what is there that invalidates Israel's repentance. Make sure it never invalidates ours. A voice was heard upon the high places. They are repenting to the true God in their Canaanite shrines in their places of idolatry. You can't do that. They've become so brazen, or had done before they went into captivity, that they would even pray to the true God in the middle of their idolatry. So they're weeping. We've done wrong. We want the rains to come back. We want to be delivered from any troubles. We cry out to our God, but they're still in the thick of their idolatry. Now, I don't know whether they actually prayed this prayer in the idolatrous shrines, but Jeremiah speaks as though they did. It's his typical graphic presentation. Well, what about today? Here are the churches borrowing from the world wholesale. They're using its music, its rhythms, it's dress, it's rap, it's everything. They're just taking wholesale from the world. What are the words they're singing? 
sacred words, good words, words of adoration to God. But God says here he won't listen to it because of what accompanies the good words. Israel could pray good words and acknowledge their sin, but while they were still involved in idolatry, God wasn't listening. It wasn't acceptable. And so it is with us. Now, we cannot say exactly what God does, because in his mercy and in his amazing patience, he will even to a great degree listen to his true children when they're in the midst of wrongdoing. So I do not want to say, this would be an oversimplification, God never listens to his people while they're employing worldly worship and all that sort of thing, but they're obviously not going to get the blessing they would like. And same with us as individuals. If we've still got a lot of the world in our lives, God may hear your prayers, but you won't know anything like the closeness and the blessing and the usefulness in the service of the Lord as you would if you properly jettisoned anything which was contrary to his will and his word. And so following this verse 21, the crooked prayers, verse 22, the appeal continues. It isn't good enough. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, and now it seems that uh, God inspires Jeremiah to teach them a model prayer of repentance. Here it is. We come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. This is how they should go about it. They never did, but this is how it should be done. Verse 23, truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills. We renounce our trust in idols. And we renounce our trust in the world. We'll do it the Lord's way. Truly in the Lord, our God, is the salvation of Israel. Verse 24. For shame hath devoured the labour of our fathers. In other words, we've had droughts and the crops have failed. And the land has become impoverished because of our sin. Even from our youth, for a long time. Flocks, herds, everything has failed. Verse 25, we lie down in our shame. We are ashamed. Repentance knows shame. And our confusion covereth us. If we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers from our youth, and so on. And then verse 1 of chapter 4 belongs to it all. If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, Return unto me. But it isn't just about them. It's a word to us. Oh, how much the Lord is ready to bless his people if we put aside our little compromises and our omissions and all these things. If we desire, and I'm sure so many of you do, and pursue this, but while we desire true dedication to him, then our prayers can be fully heard and fully answered. And that's the message of this passage. There's a lot of subjects in it, and I hope just by going through it, it makes it much easier to read as individuals and to glean the blessing.